Uh, when Good afternoon, everyone uh, who have come here. I am Silvia Arroyo. I am the coordinator of Tech and Society program by Fundación Telefónica. On and in my name and on behalf of the Aspen Institute in Spain, we wanted to thank you all for being here with us in this series of events that we started in 2017. For several years already, we have created these spaces for debates and to think about the technology's impact in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, life has, uh, is supporting this, uh, this project. We started back then when we call, talked about the bubble filter and how all these technologies would affect human rights and we see that time is on is is, is proven as right we see on a daily basis in the media that we uh, receive news about um, artificial intelligence and all sorts of new st new technologies and this gives us the strength to um, keep this cycle going on we have Monique Morrow today. She is the coordinator of the Humanized Internet Project, who, which is focused in uh, digital identity and technology in human lives. She will make a brief pres presentation, and then we will have her in a conversation with the Secretary General of Aspen Institute, uh, to whom we are very grateful for supporting us in this uh, series of events year after year. We hope that the ideas that will come up in this debate today and in the upcoming debate in the 2023 edition will uh, promote or uh, incentivate you to look the answers in technology. Thank you very much, Silvia. I just would like to add that it is a pleasure to uh, have Monique Morrow with us. She was a pioneer in Silicon Valley at Cisco and has lived firsthand the huge transformation of economy, of society, uh, by, uh, produced or by the impact of uh, digital economy uh, in the way that companies interact, in the way we uh, identify ourselves as human beings connected to uh, cell phones and we need to uh, create a path for civilization. Nick uh, brings to Madrid the best of Europe. She's based in Zurich and the best also of the US. So um, the floor is yours. Um, muchas gracias, um, Aspen Institute de España y yo. Um. Thank you, Aspen Institute in Spain and the Fundación Telefónica. I used to speak Spanish, but unfortunately I've forgotten it all, so I will move on to English now. About um, the humanized internet, um, some of the big challenges that we, may, we are faced with in our world that you read about, that you often read about, um, how it impacts you, society, democracy, you know. It doesn't have to be... Um, it doesn't have to be a dystopian future, okay? It does not have to be. So the agenda that I have proposed here, just to kind of stimulate a little bit of our, our thoughts, is around um, the whole idea of how we deal with the digital, how we deal with uh, dignity. What is dignity in the digital age? What, is, what does that look like? Um, issues around identity, digital identity. You have an identity, but it could be cultural. You're from Spain, you have a language, um, you have also a digital footprint. And I can tell you, um, I recently worked in the World Economic Forum. This will be a publication you will see on digital identity and it's very difficult to define it because we tend to intellectualize identity. We tend to intellectualize it. The internet and democracy, do we think it's under threat? Yeah. Mas menos? <laughs> do we think it's under threat, especially with how the technology is used? And then, of course, uh, the whole notion about the human-centric internet. 
Let me argue that Copernicus was wrong. The sun was not the center of the universe. The human being is the center of the universe. You are the center of the universe, especially when we talk about all of this technology coming for us. The humanized internet is not only it's a nonprofit that I founded, by the way, based in Zurich,、uh, and it has touches mainly these topics. And by the way, the next time I come out, there'll be the book. You'll see the book. It's coming out. It's a five, six-year project. Writing a book is a lot of work, but it's worth it. If you've ever been published, it's extraordinarily important. So one of the things we have to think about is how these technologies are sort of shaping our, our lives, if you will. You know, what does this mean、uh, when we have about experiences and the relationships we have, social media, responsible use of social media, what's real time? And again, we start think about. You'll see me or hear me、uh, emphasizing the point about dignity and democracy. Is you know everything we think about is contextual. So if I look at bias, it's contextual. If I look at identity, it's contextual. Everything is contextual. Deep fakes, big subject. I just visited, by the way. If you haven't seen the exposition here, Aki, see it. Deep fakes is amazing. And by the way, one of the things I didn't know it's going on for centuries. Centuries, but this time faster, because of the way technology is being used. So this is a timeline of the internet, and this is why I say, okay, the humanized internet. I will date myself. Maybe some of the people in the room will understand. When I started using technology, it was punch cards. They're in museums now. <laughs> They're punch cards, and the internet was all about communications. I just want to communicate with you. I want to send a package, packet. If you look at it from 19 what 60, 65 to 2022, we're looking at such. Uh, abundance of people being connected. You all have smartphones, I think. How many of you have had that moments where you lost it? I have. I lost it in a taxi in New York. I had a a moment where it was like my identity was gone. My entire life is on that phone. And there is academic studies to prove that it is part of you. It's an extension. It becomes part of you at the end of the day, but at the time I was starting out with this work, I it was just communications. Nobody was ever thinking of. They didn't even know what a deep fake was. We were just trying to communicate.、Uh, we didn't think about、um, marketing the internet. There was the internet bubble that occurred in the 1990s. We didn't. Nobody was thinking about that. It was far different. But now it's sort of part of our. It has become part of our lives, and it has become something embedded in our lives. But this is the picture I want you to think about: what happens in an internet minute? And by the way, we have Chat GPT up there. So, Chat GPT up there in an internet minute in 60 seconds. This is changing constantly. You can actually look, look up the reference in an internet minute. Look at what we see. Some of this has been highlighted in the、uh, in the exposition that we have here、um, in the、uh, forum by by Telefonica Fundación Telefonica. Thank you very much. But you know, you see, you see things like twenty-two thousand three eight hundred thirty-one visits to ChatGPT. Emails. By the way, who communicates in email these days? Social media. How do people receive their news? Especially if you are 17 years old or 20 years old, people are looking at TikTok, right? 
It's very, com very interesting. YouTube, Instagram, and so on and so forth. That Internet Minute is part of us. It's hugely part of us, and it's going to be more and more and more integral. So when we go back and think about the history of the Internet and what brought us here, now we have to think about what's happening every time. And by the way, the last time I saw that document, I was at the Web Summit several years ago, or that clock, and uh, in Lisbon, there was none of, none of what we see here, very little, but it's changing constantly, and who knows what's going to come up there. Who knows? So, it's all about people. It's all about us. And I say this because we have to be able to think. The question to ask yourselves, is this technology removing us from the ability to think? I visited a professor in the Middle East, and he said to me, I just want people, I just want students to have a thought that is original not to be able to look it up in Google, these days have your thesis written by chat GPT, and so on and so forth, to have an original thought. And this is why I commend uh, the Aspen Institute in Madrid, together with uh, Telefonica Fundacion, that we have this chance to have these thoughts, and these, you know, looking at what we need to do and think about it. But it's all about people at the end of the day. How many of you have been in a restaurant, family, maybe a four, two kids, parents, and they have iPads. Yes. And that's what they're queuing, is communicating with each other. Right? And I thought, oh my goodness, they don't have any i. There's no notion of, put down your iPad, let's have a conversation. And somebody told me, but that's how they communicate. Do you know, in San Francisco, there are restaurants that say, Check in your phone, check in your iPad, it's all about you. But if you're a doctor, a medical doctor, you'd have to let them know so that they can contact you. Because it's become such a disturbance for people to think and to have a conversation. But that is our reality. So when we talk about dignity in the digital space, it's very contextual. In fact, dignity and digital has been a book written by a congressman who was a United States congressman, Ro Khanna, and he is based in California. He's actually written a book. It was published in February last year uh, on this topic. But for me, it's about dignity. What is dignity? Online experiences and ethical implications. A personal story that I may share here. There is an Australian lady named Noelle Martin. You may or may not have heard of her. Now we're going to talk about dignity. Um, she, actually, I met her through the World Economic Forum, through a paper that we published that you will have a reference to, in uh, 2021, called Pathway to Digital Justice. She used Instagram. She was 17 years old, posted a picture of herself. Did not realize until she was 19 that it was showing up on pornography sites. And there was no way to erase it. No way. She is now a graduate in law school. She just graduated, actually, in Australia. She's an activist lawyer and helped change the laws in Australia. But the problem is, they didn't know where this is coming from. I could do, people could do that to you. And try scraping it from the internet. Noelle Martin, look her up, Noelle Martin. Try scraping it. It is hard, probably never to be done. And so every action that we take when we have the selfie society and this and that has a consequence, especially now. And if we link it to democracy and what can be done with democracy, it's even more interesting. I don't want to say it's a dystopian world, but I want to say it's very... We need to have an awareness of how these technologies are used. 
I find it incredible that for me to take a driver's test, I have to go through a theory and I have to go a practice exam. For the creators of these technologies or the users, they don't. You can. There's no. They have Chat GPT, by the way, for children, kids. Now, but you don't. Is it any wonder? Ask yourselves. That Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did not want to have their children to have iPhones until they were adults, they knew. They knew. So that's the thing to to think about: is responsible use. You create technology, you have a responsible use, but dignity digni dignity can get lost very easily in the example of Noel Martin, or any example that I talk about. So it's an online experience, and of course, this is a long text which our translator will read for you in Espanol. But the most important part is the second part. You know, how do we define it? But the second part is: Are we now? We're sitting comfortably in this room, creating a digital divide between the haves and have-nots, between people who. Who need to have the, who have these technologies and people who do not have these technologies? Are we? And the reason why I bring this up is because something that we talked about this morning um, is the individuals that you may meet on the street who may be homeless. The individuals. And a person I met is a name a person that lives here. Well, he lives in Barcelona. He lives in Barcelona. His name is Andrew Funk. F U N K. And he leads. He is a homeless entrepreneur. He leads. He picks up the people. Each person has a story, and creates a, a story about them. The homeless entrepreneur. People do not choose, ladies and gentlemen, to be homeless. They just don't. They don't choose to be a refugee. They just don't. There is a person behind each story, and so Andrew has got, has, has really been a, an advocate, such an advocate. His website is in Espanol, so you can read his website. And recently, he and I and a colleague from Cyprus actually participated in a story about why people. Especially those who do not, who are homeless, do not use cryptocurrency in Europe because they don't have the means, they don't have the technology. There is no, you know, know your own customer and so on. So that's dignity as an example. And there is this notion about erosion of your dignity. So um, privacy. How many of you believe privacy is totally dead? Do you believe it's dead? See, we have some people who believe it's dead. Are you concerned that it's dead? Here's why. Privacy. The thing of it is, is that there is the Internet of Me, and there's surveillance, and there's also policing. I deal with this every day、um, because. Because I I know people who are in the police world, like family members, and I know people who are very concerned that their privacy is gone. You need to think about it. Goes back to the digital dust that you leave. Whether or not、um, you're concerned about your own privacy, and here's why. Is it realistic to disconnect yourself from the internet? The answer is no. We just we can throw that theory out. If you believe privacy is dead, then I can take your identity and do everything I want with it. Everything. The technology is here. How many of you give your credit card to a person in the restaurant? I can tell you, it's been done, where the numbers have been read and it's passed on to something somebody else, and that happened to me. I was a victim of that.、It、just happens. You just freely give it out, right? And so, I would argue this is why we have interesting laws in Europe called GDPR. 
that protects the, you, that should protect you. But as I said before, there is the internet of me and surveillance. Now, I am a Swiss citizen and a US citizen. I have two passports. In Switzerland, recently, the Swiss rail decided that it wanted to actually see who's commuting across the border. They wanted to actually say, yeah, we're interested, we're going to feed you some information, and so on. The Swiss people went crazy. They said, what are you doing there? Okay, so, but things can happen where you, where you don't know it. I lived, in Chi I lived in Hong Kong, so I know about this. Um, you know the Chinese credit system, they do it. You cross the light, you, you're uh, on the walk, and it's red, and you cross, it's flashed. You lose social credit, by the way, you lose it. Your name is flagged, and you may not be able to travel, you may not be able to do this and that. That's the extreme state. It's been in existence for several years. Do we get to that state? Hopefully not. That's why we're, we have in Europe, we have in Spain, the ability to, to question that kind of capability. But the online actions do have consequences. And I deal with it, you know, uh, in, in, in many worlds. I'm actually a co-chair, I'm actually a chair of the internet, uh, of the um, IEEE, which is Electrical Engineers Elect International, group of ethics in extended reality and ethics in the metaverse. The metaverse is interesting, by the way. So gaming, robots, etc. It all has consequences. I have a colleague, she and her husband are lawyers. They're actually AI lawyers. Their son, one, they have two children. One of the sons has had a difficult time in school, really difficult. He's, he's autistic. But, but, but um, it comes out in, in the fact that he, he is, uh, it's it, difficult for him to sit in a classroom. So how does he and daddy come communicate through their gaming consoles. They're gamers. They communicate that way. They communicate. And it so happens that Daddy is also on the spectrum. But the thing of it is, is that we're living in this world, and do we risk disconnecting ourselves from society? Do we? And I think this is something to kind of think about AI, robots. I mean, the whole issue about robots and AIs taking over the world. You know, here's the thing. When you create technology, it has to have an intention. Just as you say a pack of cigarettes can cause you cancer, what was the intention of the technology you created in the first place? Why? So we'll kind of challenge that a little bit. The self, your identities, and sort of the policy frameworks for protecting your identities. Because identities, as I said before, can and often is stolen. And another personal case that happened to me, I was a Swisscom VIP customer. By the way, I worked for the company years ago. VIP means I, spent, I, I actually spend more money, right? It so happened that a group of us, the group of our identities, our phones, mobile phone numbers, fell in the hands of a third party that they were not paying attention to. It wasn't hacked. It was not hacked. It wasn't enough that the CEO said, lo siento, sorry. I was affected too. The implication for me was that I started to get robocalls. Ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum, ba ba ba. That was the problem. So we have to be careful about how identities can be co opted. So we tend to hide behind the abstract when we talk about digital identity. This was the topic of the WEF discussion that we had, the WEF paper that will be soon published. 
people intellectualize it. I talk about self-sovereign identity. I talk about it from a from a you know uh, intellectual discussion. Whereas one of the working groups I was in, they were trying to talk about it from the persona, from the person who happens to be a refugee, from the person who happens to be homeless, from the person who happens to be from an indigenous group that has no access, and that was. Interestingly enough, very difficult. Very difficult. They couldn't do it. We managed to do some of it. We managed to do some of it. I tell you. But it's all about you. And as I said before, people don't choose to be a refugee. I visited the refugee camps in、um, under the United Nations, in、um, Zatari, in, outside of Jordan. These are people who just did not choose to be there. They are medical doctors. They are nurses. They may dri- be driving your Ubers.、Um, they are scholars, and circumstances had them there. Okay. My co-founder and pres-、uh, of the Humanized Internet is one of them. In fact, in fact, the personal story here is he was in Greece. He was studying. 2014. Think about it. Back in time, not too far back, and the war was getting Syria. It's really getting serious, and the Greek government summar- summarized him, sum- summoned him rather, and asked him to present the, his latest visa for Syria. Where was he going to get it? In Athens. It would have been his death sentence. So he was one of the people walking into Berlin. And can tell you how easy it is to fake a paper document. It so happens. Fast forward this year, he's a software engineer, and he will soon be a German citizen. So that's a good story. That's a great story. But you just don't choose it, right? You don't choose it when a fire comes to your home. You don't choose it when there's a flood. You don't choose it when there's an earthquake. It's what documents will you take with you? And how fast will you move on those documents? But in the internet and democracy, I don't know about you, but it's an interesting space. <laughs> We're having elections in 2024 in the United States. You're having your own elections, I think, in August, August, right?、Um, and there's a lot of use of this technology to create narratives. That only foster narratives in a filter bubble. I know you know the term filter bubble because you've heard it before. It's only my bubble that I'm using it, and so this becomes the weaponization aspect of it. And don't get me wrong, there are good uses of these technologies. There certainly are, but this is something that we have to be very cognizant about. Is sort of the weaponization of it. Is it too late? Is is it too late? For our democracy, I, I can't answer that question, but you can see it: how the waves are going far left, far right, extreme left, extreme right. Do technologies play this point? I know in the Council of Europe, they're ask, actually looking for consultation in some of this area, but it's just interesting. And there is a tectonic shift. The shift is here. There's no turning back. The door has been opened. The Pandora's box has been there, and democracy could be very much in peril, peril if we're not careful. It is the old adage: while you're sleeping, it suddenly happens. While you're sleeping, there's a big election. While you're sleeping, somebody comes out of the woods and says, "I am yours." Right? It happens. And so I think this is important. Is there another alternative in French? Sorry about the translation because I'm half French. In the French-speaking part of Switzerland, they have a when you ask a person there to make a decision, they will say ni l'un ni l'autre bien au contraire. Neither one nor the other. There's another one, right? Never ask them to make a decision. Ni l'un ni l'autre bien au contraire. So that's the thing that we have to to consider. And here's the thing that's the most re- interesting realities that we have to look at. Here are the headlines. 
I find it interesting that the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, has basically said, oh my God, we're at this moment, it's, it's disconcerting, it's weaponization time, there's no turning back, that's why he quit Google. There is, um, the EU just recently had a landmark decision on this particular topic, just recently. I think it's interesting that the founder of OpenAI for ChatGPT said, please, please, please help us, regulate us, regulate us. We didn't know what we were doing, right? In other words, we didn't know what we were doing. But it, it is kind of interesting that everybody's sort of kind of pointing it out that there is this weaponization that is occurring. But I do say, that's the polarity. There are good uses. There are positive uses. I have a friend who was diagnosed recently with stage four ovarian cancer, sarcoma, metastasis. Wouldn't it be nice to have a use for that to detect it earlier, to do something? There are some very interesting uses in this space with these technologies. But however, there's something that's happening in this space. And one of the people I know from the AI world who works for an automobile company in Europe, said, I'm concerned. And he told me this three years ago. And I said, why? Why are you concerned? And he said, if you put in mother, if you put in woman, what you have is prostitute and mother. You can't blame AI for it. It is picking up the conversations and discussions picking up these large data sets. And that was concerning for him, because he saw that it was, it was turning to something that he could not basically control. Right? And I think that's what Jeffrey Hinton was hinting. Right? So this is, this is the thing, and here's the point I want to make. If you create technology, be intentional about it. Ethics is contextual. Ethics, by the way, in the UK, used to be part of physics, because you could ask those questions, right? It's interesting. But if, if you're using the technology and said, we created this technology, this is the intentional use, going beyond that is a red line, that's what you should say. But you have nation states who want to weaponize it. Um, you have companies who want to monetize it, the capabilities. So it's a, it's a polarity that we have to pay, pay attention to. It isn't any wonder that you have the nation states. Read, read China's five-year plan. It's in English. It's there. They're very clear. Or even the Russian Federation. Very clear. So this is something we have to be very, very pay attention to. So you are the center. You are the center, and it doesn't mean a dystopian future, it really doesn't. There's some really fascinating work that's happening here um, that I think is going to be really interesting for us all, and look, but we have to be, have an awareness of the polarities that we're creating. The question is, what will you do? You know, when you walk away today, what will you do? When you see the homeless person, what will you do? Um, you know, when my mother saw a homeless per person, my mother was an icon in her community. She passed away in 2013. She would not give the person money. She would take the person to a restaurant, and one of them did not have any teeth. And what did he order? Barbecue spare ribs. <laughs> but it was a great meal for him. He loved it. And that's the way, you know, you have to think about the humans in this category. But here are the references. That's the website. Um, there's also the pathway to digital justice. Please read the document. Uh, the example of Noel Martin is there. It was cross, cross um, ecosystem work. Digital identity is coming up. And the book that's taking me five to six years is going to be published in, in August. And there's no chat GPT behind it. So. <laughs> Thank you so very much.
Thank you so much, Monique, for this wonderful presentation. Yeah. So, the idea is to open the floor for questions and comments sure. and profit from, from your visit to Madrid. Sure. But I would like to make sure that you know we're uh, eager to read your book mm. and that hopefully we can do an event about it uh, once it's published. Uh, May I ask you just a couple of questions to start a conversation? Um, uh, I wanted to go back to what you said about the origin of, of the internet mm -hmm. and how you develop it for communication, and that was the, the main purpose, even the sole purpose. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from what I've learned from, from your generation of pioneers, is that um, it was very uh, ruler averse. It wasn't about uh, creating a framework uh, mm -hmm. through legislation, uh, even taxation, you know, liability. It was much more about um, discovering a new continent mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, you had like a new beginning and, uh, and it was really about community. It's very interesting. It wasn't about rights. It was about strengthening communities, uh, collaboration, solidarity. And you fast forward to, to our days, and, and we have this battle between right-minded people, uh, mostly Europeans, and still um, very libertarian uh, voices, that in spite of all the dangers and responsibilities of our digital identities, want to go back to that romantic idea of, of very little regulation or even zero. So could you? Expand a bit about that. Okay, um, so let me bring it down a little bit. Um, so regulation, the problem we have with regulation that you can overregulate what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, and so this, this is the challenge. Uh, and it may stifle innovation. So when, peop when you have people before coming before Congress or pr the Parliament and saying regulate us, it's what do we mean by that? So that's one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect is y you need a balance. It's really the balance. If you over-rotate on regulation, um, then uh, people will find a way to go elsewhere. You know, they'll, do, they'll find a loophole, they'll find some place to go elsewhere. It is a discussion we were having earlier with regard to uh, what is the what is the makeup of somebody who represents, who is in the European Union, what kind of background should they have, um, you know, should they have a degree, to, so they un should understand the technology, should they be able to um, provide a feedback to it, etc. But people, when they're elected, typically are elected because of a, a platform. I want to lower taxes, I want to, you know, pe people elect you typically for that, right? So that's, that's, a, that's the challenge. Um, I remember being in a World Economic Forum industry planning session uh, in, in March, and I was talking to one of the colleagues from France before the election that came out. And fundamentally, um, you know, before all of this uses of, of these, these procedures that they came out with, which was interesting in itself, he said, you know, if it swings to the far right, or if it swings to the far left in this particular case, they would pull out business. They would just leave the countries, right? They would just leave, you know? So you, there are ramifications at, at that regulatory area and about law. You're right, it was about community building. We didn't have any notion of all of what we're talking about. But I think that's the reality. We, we, we're dealing with this reality as we, uh, we are, and I think that now it's more or less how do we just balance it without, without over-regulating. And I think that's the more interesting thing, is the, to be able to balance it uh, carefully. I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. And I was also struck by, by your question, and I have no answer either, uh -huh. about whether we can still have original thoughts and we can really uh, engage in collective action you know, to strengthen democracy through technology, to really create uh, a sense of, um, you know, again, um, belonging to, to a group presided by, by certain values, 
and, and giving new meaning to to the idea of, of civilization, you know, yeah. with all the pluralism and all the differences that exist in the world. So, is digital, is digital technology really preventing us from creating those spaces and those actions to strengthen democracy? Oof, that, that's a multimodal question. So you've got thought and you've got democracy. And well, first of all, um, when it comes to thoughts. Um, I happen to be oh, a Luddite. I like books. So I will hold a book. You will see me... <laughs> you'll see all kinds of pin marks in the books, and I like the library. I Hopefully the library will never go away. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, so thoughts. I think it's a, a matter of how we're using, um, how we're setting up a dependency in, in, in today's society. You have couples who are working, uh, they may not have time, uh, they're, you know, get the kid over there, especially when we had COVID, what was happening with COVID and the whole situation about families and, and trying to, what it was the dependency on these, uh, these technologies. Uh, I think having, uh, have being able to read back or having a, a thought that is an original thought about something without going to too much to a Google or a ChatGP. It's a matter of how you use the tool. It's like spell checker. How do you use these tools without, without such an over-dependency? And I'm hoping that, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that that go, doesn't go away, that people will have thoughts that are their own original thoughts, that they will have a point of view we may, may not agree, but at least we have a point of view. And I think that's uh, quite important in itself. As far as the democracy is concerned, democracy... Um, th there is the tools, there are the tools that are, are, are being um, used that are, could be misused, but there's also... Um, there's also the, the, the way we we have the right to vote. How many people vote? Recently, in, in Switzerland, last Sunday, we had a, a vote. Climate was one of them, by the way. I find it interesting that 42% of a country of close to over a little over 9 million voted. Only 42%. And by the way, you can break it down to the age groups. And you can break it down to the... And it's interesting that you'll have folks who will come in and they will, you know, rip your, basically say it's not enough, we're ad, um, activists, and, and you have to be real careful here as a balance. It may not happen, especially in the climate change situation, as fast as people want. I live in Zurich, which is more green socialist, but the problem is if you own a car, people are scratching the car, they're getting in the way of the highway, the ambulances cannot come, and it's swinging to the right, politically. That has nothing to do with technology. That has something to do with social responsibility, right? Technology is one aspect of it. But in a country where you're not voting, we have an expression in German which basically said, you're guilty. Whatever happens, you're guilty. Don't complain. And in some cantons, they will actually penalize you. They will actually penalize you if you don't vote. Because it's your right to vote. You should vote. So that's something that we should, you know, if we have a conversation like this, I'll say, did you vote? And in Switzerland, it's easy to vote. It really is. The mail-in ballot comes in automatically. I don't have to order a special mail-in ballot. It comes in automatically. Why wouldn't you not use it? Hmm. Right? It, very seldom do people actually go to a polling station. They do if they want to have a social conversation, but it's, it's so easy. And so 42% um, is concerning for me. Thank you. One more question before I open it to, to the rest of uh, participants. Um, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, as I see it in the stage of development, but this changes every day because it's, uh, it's going so quickly. Um, Artificial intelligence poses risks of increasing inequality, yes. and I think we may fear a populist backlash. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, the problem of uh, weapons um, and, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the experts 
in this field have predicted that there's a chance that, you know, a 10% chance that artificial intelligence will destroy the planet, mm -hmm. which is very disquieting. Yep. And also artificial intelligence um, connected to the search for truth. Mm -hmm. you know, Michael Ignatieff was here in this uh, program uh, less than, than a month ago, and he spoke uh, very eloquently about the impossibility of telling uh, true and false um, because of the impact of chat GPT and all the um, uh, you know, learning that is going on uh, through artificial intelligence that is self uh, with self-supervision and with no accountability and then the experts just asking for a pause and not knowing what policy should be applied. So, uh, am I too pessimistic about these three risks? I think, well, let's... I love your questions. I'm getting to... The truth is contextual. It, it depends. The answer is it. It's, it depends. It's contextual what truth is these days. Um, however, artificial intelligence is... is Hinton had it right, you know, it has the potential of weaponization. Now, I'm in IEEE for the engineers in the room. Um, it's interesting that we started out with ethics in autonomous systems in The Hague in 2016. In The Hague. A autonomous systems. How they can be used, how weapons can be used, right? So weapons, people would say, well, you know, they don't have to worry about it. The soldier of the future is going to be different. It'll be an autonomous <laughs> weapon. Um, and, and so there were there was this pause that said, wait a minute, we need to talk about ethics in this space, right? It's easy to think you're going to send robots there or whatever. And in military institutes and military academies, they're actually teaching soldiers something, not strategy, but they're teaching them about their narrative. You're in the future, work it back, what does the narrative look like? It's more of a narrative stu study. They're teaching it at Arizona, Arizona State University, for example, these kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think that the weaponization component of it is of, of deep concern. It was deeply of concern of the people who were at The Hague, who represent a cross group of uh, society, uh, academics, also uh, members of companies, um, and, and so on, who are very strong in this field. I'm also concerned about something we, we didn't really address, which is programmability of your life. We need to think about what randomization means. Exactly. Right? I go, I take the metro here in Madrid, and maybe I meet the love of my life. It's randomized, right? Who, who would have thought, right? Anything is possible. But we become too program, program, programmatic here. So I would be very concerned about that. Um, and I think we're just seeing the tip of the... People talk about nuclear, nuclear, but I, I think people are seeing just the tip of what is the art of the possible. Uh, and, in, and in that case, it could be of, of great concern about, you know, these, these kinds of s scenarios. So, of course, I would be very concerned about it. And, yeah, and then again, truth again being sort of this filter bubble of truth, which is contextual. We will never have a right answer. Truth is what I see, it's what you see. It's different, it's cognitive bias that we put together. Um, and, uh, you know, you live it and you amplify it in, in, in w worlds that you're going to be having, wanting this to be amplified. So, um, it's also how we receive news, it's all, that's another part. Uh, I talked about TikTok, lots going on in that space. You know, who watches broadcast news these days, or who uses email these days. So, so those are things that to, to think about. But I would be watching it. Thank you. I, I would be visiting a military academy these days and asking the officers and candidates, what are they thinking about it? Thank you. So let's open to your random questions and comments. Uh, and may I ask you just to say your name before you speak and just make a short question or, or comment, please. We need to bring your microphone. Yeah, 
Um, I'm Paula Gutierrez. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear you. And I want to know, what do you think about the responsibility of academy in all this situation about um, artificial intelligence and privacy problems in society? Because um, even in the most important universities in the European Union, when, uh, where uh, GDPR is mandatory, software engineers don't study anything about ethics, anything about um, privacy by default and by design. They don't know Anka Woken or nothing at all. And they just are looking for functionality. What do you think about it? Um, excellent question. So, excellent question. So, um, I work with software, I used to work with software engineers. Um, Everything was about, look at your GitHub. Um, nobody talked about privacy by design. By the way, there is the privacy by design is, is, is an engineering function. There's an engineering manifesto written about it. Nobody uh, really, with the software engineering engineers, they're just told what to do. And they're told, typically, I, I'm going to make a horrific generalization, but they're told under the threat of their job Right? You do this, you get it done, sometimes you'll have a job, sometimes you don't. It's not about moving off to, offshore to India anymore. By the way, they're moving to Costa Rica, just as an example. And they don't know. They, and so when you take them aside, they basically will say, I had no idea, you know? So, so and, 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 th and that's kind of the old-fashioned, I think that's, for me, is an old-fashioned way of thinking about design and software engineering and responsibility and technology. As is my mantra, security is everybody's responsibility, not just a CISO's responsibility, software engineering. I mean, ethics should be really embedded. Responsibility of, of privacy should be embedded because who gets the knock on the door when something happens is whom? The CEO. And the CEO goes and goes and it goes down. And it's old-fashioned. But when you take the engineers to the side, they, they basically said, you know, we just never knew. We never were taught it. And so my argument is, uh, why not? I mean, this is an opportunity for, the, for people who are an academic to actually teach it, to actually give an exercise on it, to actually look at, ooh, where is, where is there a leak here? Where is there pseudonymization of addressing here? Where is the address being leaked here, et cetera, type of thing. It's an interesting exercise to do. But that would be my thing, is that it's not taught enough such that you see it in the workplace. The workplace, having worked in private industry uh, for many, many, many years, is concerned about this. Revenue, 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 revenue. Out of job, out of job, out of job. Revenue, 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 out of job. Right? And that's, that's, that's a gross generalization, but that's the reality. Thank you. We have a question here. My question is related to the last point you have been touching upon. Uh, and it is the following. You know, it's very important to care about digitalization internet. Uh, it is a very important and pertinent uh, activity, particularly if you th are caring for human dignity, mm -hmm. people's dignity. But you know, recently people are talking something else. As a matter of fact, people are talking on a new humanism, a new biodigital humanism, and even a post-humanism. A new post humanism. What do you think about that? Can, can you say your name, please? Adolfo Castilla. Thank Adolfo. you. So, Senor Castilla. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I'm interpreting by your answer is that will the human race be put out of the human race when we're talking about neo humanism and new humanism and, uh, you know, are we going, are, we're, we're evolving, that's for sure. We have been evolving for many, many, many years. Um, 
it is a discussion, an interesting discussion that we had at the World Government Summit in Dubai several years ago about the future of the human race, the future of what these technologies taking over you, um, and um, you just being being a, just a subject of something else, right? Uh, well, I think that's that's a, rel uh, a relative concern um, to have. Are we quite there yet? No. Would we be there? Who knows? I mean, we, we have to be cognizant. And it's a great question to, to sort of ask yourself. I know people who want a lot of data sets because of genomics. They want your DNA. Why wouldn't I give my DNA to, if, if it's going to be interesting to solve for my, you know, the future of cancer problems and et cetera? They want your DNA, but what happens with that? stuff, right? So, yeah, I mean, transhumanism and, 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 and all of this, is neo-humanism is going to be an interesting space to, to, to watch out for. I happened to be with a colleague at the time we were having this debate, and she comes, um, she's actually a physicist, and she's actually uh, involved in education in Kinshasa, in the Congo Democratic Republic. And she said, you know, that starts to happen. Think about what's happening in Africa. What would happen in Africa? What would happen to us? By the way, Africa, 54 countries, 1.4 billion people, all under the age of 19. They're already talking about concerns of this issue, but they are also looking at techno-colonialism, which is a different topic. So, I would just be aware of it. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Irene, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Irene Del Pino. Um, you mentioned GDPR and how in Europe we have privacy laws that are, actually they were created something like a few years back. But I'm um, kind of concerned about if uh, the lack of a global regulation. So for instance, uh, data being exported to the US and basically stored there regardless of where you come from. Um, in a former life as a as an international executive in a major company, I was in the middle of so many schemes in which uh, the interpretation between uh, privacy in the US and privacy in Europe was creating conflict that I'm really concerned about the lack of regulation. And, and you mentioned it is not only nation states, it's just companies wanting to monetize and not having a strong ethical component regardless of the laws that actually make CEOs liable. So I'm curious about your viewpoint yeah. and how that could be solved. So I think um, GDPR should not be a checklist called compliance on somebody's mm -hmm. checklist. I think that's important. People look at it and say, well, we, we're compliant. Really? I don't think so. I mean, I think you need to... So we have to... We fall behind, just as I said, intellectualizing digital identity. We fall behind that. Uh, laws in the United States vary. Um, they vary if you're hip, if in California, they have one of the strictest laws. Uh, and also HIPAA for healthcare is hugely strict. So it just, it just varies uh, by state by state, um, so it depends. However, if I go to Kenya and look at privacy, they're adopting a GDPR model, right? So they're trying to adopt the European model. They're trying to look at it from a European perspe perspective to look at it that way. But I think it's more or less, uh, as you well pointed out, it's easier to fall behind it and then say, okay, where is the data really being stored? Is it being stored in some kind of um, pseudo-virtual data center that happens to be based in a tunnel in Denver? Uh, you know, I don't know, but you know, that's, those are very relatively uh, interesting questions to ask. I think, and, and in terms of regulation, it, it goes to the earlier questions about how much you regulate before you stifle innovation. So you have to be kind of cognizant of, of those particular, particular issues. So privacy, uh, you know, there's the citizen privacy, there's the privacy of a company, you work for a company, and the concerns that people have. But I have a colleague who's been working in the space for many years, and privacy is this. This is the way she puts it. Why would you close your windows? 
if you're, if you're not concerned. You know, think about what happens in your windows, right? Why would you? And so think about, you know, when Google, when Google was using all of this sort of uh, technology to kind of learn a little bit, they would pass by homes and sort of, and people were going, oh my goodness, what are, what are they doing? I, I call Google out because that was known. That's not to, to denigrate Google. But I mean, those are the known things. So uh, my, my counsel here is to watch out about privacy and compliance and not to hide behind it. Mm. And to really challenge and openly challenge it. Thank you. Please. Monique, I'm very integrated about your book. I really am I'm eager to read your book okay. uh, coming soon. And uh, yeah, my name is yeah. Charlie. Hi, <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> and, Hola. Uh, as a lawyer by training, my, my question to you is, what about thinking in principles based on the public international law yes. to integrate in this discussion about not only regulating, but also creating principles, principles that goes beyond the speed of technological development, mm -hmm. principles like, like no harm, mm -hmm. transparency, good faith, um, also thinking in, the, in, the, in, in making social wellness and fairness the first priority for any technological development. Uh, again, as a lawyer, sometimes I, I believe that it's obsolete to, to think in over-regulating, over um, you know, dramatizing uh, in order to, to arrive with the lastest norm when we have to concentrate more in norms that become in a longer um, bit uh, for everyone. So Charlie, m music to my ears, um, you can be my lawyer too. Um, the, the, the Council of Europe, as we know, um, is actually, there is some consultation about human rights. Right? Dignity is defined, human rights. And so I remember, um, actually, you're going to see a, um, some documentation published probably by the end of the year, because this was around metaverse and stuff in that nature, but human rights, the rights of mankind, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And the engineering, engineers in the room were going, we don't know about human rights. I don't want to touch human rights. I'm a, I, 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 uh, human rights is not in my vocabulary, but human rights has to be a tenant, right? Uh, and so, um, so that's, those are, and, and it so happens, uh, I have a colleague who is in Vienna and she's struggling, she's like the term, you know, the term herding cats. She's trying to get people to actually think about those rights, those principles. Let's start about who you are as a human being and start with those tenets and principles uh, we can always paint, you know, technology is sort of the crutch, but it's talk about where there is an impact on the human right. Is this an impact on the human right? Is, is X an impact on your dignity? And so on and so forth. There, were, there are charters that have been well, well defined. We just don't, unfortunately, read them well. And engineers tend to, and I say that because I'm the accidental engineer in the room. I wanted to be like you when I grew up. Um, is is to, to look at it from a different perspective. What if we were all to get in the room, the lawyer, the engineer, the, tra the transhumanist, and, and, and say, okay, let's define, let's define technology in the way that's going to serve a, a purpose for all of us, right? That would be an interesting space. I don't think that's impossible. Really, it isn't. But it is, uh, it is there, and the cal this is something that we're talking about. I, and I also, just to, to, to bridge on to that, I believe in lifelong education. So I believe in knowing what I don't know, I don't know. So, um, you know, I'm, I am in the beginning to do a PhD. It's never too late. It's going to take three years. In cyber psychology. In cyber psychology. Which is a new discipline. And um, that's going to be interesting. The chair happens to be in Dublin. So uh, stay tuned for that, that one to come out soon. From the floor. Uh, the floor. Uh, Fernando Mujica, how are you? Hi, Thank hi. you very much. Um, you were talking about privacy before at the beginning. Yep. Um, in a social media world, how do you reverse a, a tide that has basically made people renounce their privacy willingly 
because they're human because as we have so seen over these last years uh, social media has arised this uh, human sentiment to not feel alone to be heard to not feel isolated to be to be the to be uh, to be in the center of everything how do you manage to reverse that tide where people have actually uh, created a a reward system where renouncing their privacy has gives them rewards such as the likes, follows, um, even physical rewards like people that uh, upload a picture of themselves uh, on a bikini or, with, or, or showing their apps and companies approach them to tell them you can win money with this. How do you reverse through education a society that basically already knows they have no privacy anymore and still, like with tobacco, still will will upload those photos or still smoke even though you could plaster a sign saying you have no privacy if you do this people would most certainly do it anyway how do you reverse that well that's a so uh, an excellent question one that uh, we struggle with struggling with all the time every day to renounce your privacy when you're renouncing your privacy right when you're just giving it away the only thing I mean, uh, y y yes, you can do some things in the education space, right? You can actually teach. So there's, so, so there's issues around how you teach, teach that and teach it uh, responsibly. Also, whether it's in... By the way, I was talking to some teachers uh, in Switzerland. You cannot even teach this in, in high school. You have to go in grade school. You have to go, like, in... First grade, second grade. You have to teach that. I mean, I was sitting at breakfast this morning in the hotel, wonderful Spanish family, and they had their iPads out. Bah, 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 bah. The kids were probably around five or six years old. So you have to be able to teach that very early. So uh, it's, not a lot, it's not enough to say, okay, I'm going to teach it. In, uh, and so that's responsible use because it has implications. The only thing I can say is, Think about what happened to Noel Martin. You're deep faked. You're on a porn site. You didn't know it until somebody points it out to you suddenly. And your identity is totally, totally ruined. You are ruined. So that's an extreme, what, what, I, what I say. But I think it has to my recommendation would start to teach the use of these technologies responsibly quite early. And by the way, it starts in families. I'm, I'm sorry, but we, 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 we can put it to education, we could put it to regulation, we could put it to whatever, but it's how the family communicates with one another, right? It's basically no time, you know, let's, let's put this down, let's have, you know, let's have a discussion about how we use these technologies today. You know, that starts there. Uh, but when you're too busy to have that conversation, you can't leave it to the schools to do that. You have to be able to have it in your family. Thank you. It's, it's a great question that I struggle with all the time. But if you have met Noel, and you, you'll read the document that I have here, you will understand how horrific that situation was for her. Thank Posting you. on Instagram. Yeah. Look at my picture. <laughs> sure. Don't look at my picture. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Rocio Perales. I wanted to thank you for your enlightening presentation. Thank you. And I wanted to come back to democracy. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the worrying 42%, and I was wondering whether this would show a lack of trust in democracy or some sort of like hopelessness around it. And to what extent is technology playing a role in this trend, and how? Oof. Um, so let's talk, let's go, you're talking about Switzerland. So one of the things about Switzerland, I always like to say it's the purest democracy, because it takes 50,000 signatures to have a referendum. So we're constantly voting. You want a referendum on this? Get 50,000 signatures, bam, it's going to be on a vote. Um, I think... I don't think it's because of technology. I don't think so. It's very convenient to vote there. It's just very convenient. 
I'm not sure if it's an inherent trust issue. That's another question. Right? That's, 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 that's another question. By the way, I can go and visit the parliament any time. I can be part of that debate, etc. You, you, it's open. I can take a train with a parliamentarian. I can take a train with somebody. It's not, they're approachable, right, these days. But it, it's more or less, is it laziness? I, I have a theory it could be. Or is it the discussion so hot that, or maybe it's not as hot as they want it to be? I don't know. So, I find it interesting. I row. I'm a rower, right? So, like the lakes. And stuff. <laughs> Something you discovered this morning. That, um, and, I, and, and I find it here that what I'm learning in Madrid is such a, there's so much responsibility. In the hotel I'm in, they don't use plastics or whatever. It's great. But if you go along the lake, you have, you have the poor people partying. What are they doing? They're throwing their cans in the lake. I mean, these are the types of things, right? So it gets to, if this particular vote was related to climate change, it went all across the parties. They said, go for it, and they did. But 42 percent? Not. Not, not uh, impressive. And so we have to think about, you know, what happens if, what happens if suddenly we live, in a, we live in sort of this bubble, I, I will say Switzerland is a little bubble, we're a little country, a little, 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 little tiny country. But there has to be sort of this responsible, you know, set the example of, of, of if you don't vote, what are the implications for you? And, and as I said before, um, you know, when you have these very extreme groups, whether Again, it's not technology related, but if you have extreme groups sh scratching your car or doing nasty things to it because you happen to be driving or sitting in the middle of a, a freeway uh, to block traffic because you didn't, you, you're not hap it's not climate change and what you're doing about climate is not happening fast enough, I'm, I get concerned about that because why? It will sway to the right very quickly and it could sway to the extreme right, if you're not careful. And that's, that's a concern I have. That has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with how we comport ourselves. If we care about climate, do we go and how, how, you, how you use plastics, how, you know, if you look at what's happening with the fish, and except in, the, in, in, in these waters, it's very, it's very deep, disconcerting to me, personally and how you are responsible for, you, for that. That's its responsibility at the end. It's civic duty. It's civic duty is that. It has nothing to do with technology. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anybody? If not, I would really like to thank you, Monique, thank for you. your visit, for your wonderful talk. And thank you all. Remember to vote, and hopefully we will vote. see you. We'll see you next fall. I know he did it. I know your vote is in August, but vote. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Felicitas, Juan.